So earlier this morning, we heard from a number of the federal agencies that, you know, what cloud adoptions they've t- they've taken on. And now we're going to hear from a couple of state and local agencies. Warm. Um, the moderator for this session is... Um, has worked very closely with SIA for a really long time, um, always provides a, a very good insight into the market. Um, so I'll turn it over to Bill McNee, who's the CEO of Salgatech Technology, and he can introduce his group, who I know are also going to present their, their case studies on their um, cloud adoptions. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill McNee, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with um, I think it's a, a, a good counterpoint to some of the discussions today. We've already heard a terrific uh, uh, panel earlier focusing on some federal case studies, and later today we'll actually hear a, a, a federal CIO panel. But I'm delighted to be joined this morning by two representatives that kind of give us a different perspective at the state and local level. Uh, and uh, joining me are Garrison. Glad Felter, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. Who's the uh, director of prevention, drug, and bureau of drug and alcohol pro- uh, pr- uh, programs in PA Department of Health, and uh, Mike Goodrich. Hopefully, he didn't have to travel too far. Uh-huh. Uh, who's the director of, of admin at the Arlington Economic Development? So, what I'd like to do in kicking off the session is to have each just uh, share a little bit about you know their roles and responsibilities and what their agencies are doing uh, related to the cloud. So do you want to kick it off for us, uh, Garrison? Uh, yeah. Um, for us, for me, being a program-specific person inside of a department, we do have an, uh, an IT uh, unit that handles certain things. But um, the software vendor we use, uh, Kid Solutions, we actually started originally with them in 1996, redid that uh, software in 2003. Uh, was basically a cost reimbursed type process. And the decision was to bring it in-house in 2003. Um, and over the, the several years, uh, I was an analyst at that time. I worked my way up being the director. Uh, you get to a point where there's limitations within government. The skills, the ability to purchase the kind of things you need. And I think the cloud, which I didn't at the time know what that kind of was, um, Kit Solutions changed their business model to go into a service uh, type software and it really fit because one of the things in human services especially being in drug and alcohol prevention everybody says that's an important thing no one wants to spend money on that and does it really work that's a big question so for us it's really important to have the ability to advance that software quickly efficiently so my role as a director is to be thinking about how I can meet federal reporting requirements because our office does get a tremendous amount of federal government funding And then look at how do I uh, help our field to better manage what they're doing, to really get show legislators and and constituents what they're getting for a very small amount of money. And I think the key this cloud process allows is a flexibility that I can focus on the program side, grants management, and don't have to worry about our IT folks telling us, well, we can't do that maybe in 10 years, maybe we'll get it done. And I have folks that I have to serve, which means our stakeholders, they're frustrated. So I think in an environment of cutbacks um, that we all face, this model really, I think, is the future direction, especially for us in the human service area. I know a lot of things I heard today seem to be the bigger federal agencies, but I think this is the direction and encourage software vendors to really come in and and provide the kind of uh, software that will allow us to manage uh, the grants and what we do. You know, we had a terrific conversation last night. I I drove down from Connecticut, and we had a good call uh, in preparation for today, and I learned a lot more about this application from you. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll I'll help you flesh it out a little bit. So if I understand correctly, this was originally a custom application. That is correct. And it was rewritten in 03 in .NET. That is correct. And then there were some technical challenges in 07, but then you guys uh, also then went into uh, and combined some resources with some other uh, states that contributed some assets as, as well. And the thing moved from a proprietary solution to kind of a combination of assets that ultimately has been now delivered as a multi-state 
software as a service solution. Is that kind of the evolution? Yeah, it's very uh, basic. In, uh, what happened in 2000, I think, other states started coming on board and they used the Citrix uh, initially was the model and we, at the time, did not want to go down that path. And um, in fact, in 2003, .NET had just come out and we, originally our uh, contract actually uh, had just ASP, did not get to .NET, we agreed to go down that road. So for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we were the first state agency that was going to have an application written in .NET. Um, as, a, as a result of that, Kit Solutions did have other states. It allows them to leverage each state's uh, expenditures, growth, and development. And we have a learning community that if you go back to the original software they built in 1996, you can still see components of that software and, and how we operate. So I think what that's been real nice is um, it gives standardization to the federal government even though they're working towards that, we have a platform that allows the flexibility. So, for instance, uh, New York is building an entire coalition component, and, and I don't mandate that in my state, but I needed components of that. So I'm gonna take what they've done and custom it to what will make my need integrated into my existing system. I could not have done that working in the environment of, of our RIT. They just did, they were limited with their abilities. And the other challenge in government, we have two full-time people assigned to our uh, bureau. They are entry-level positions that constantly go, which means we have often nobody there. And that makes it very difficult to advance forward and having an application that, that actually can be used, uh, especially when uh, the amount of data we collect, and I recently had a technical assistance done by the federal government to look at our system. And what I was pretty sure would be the result, we're data rich but information poor. And because of this cloud um, contracting, Kit Solutions has a, a real-time data visualization, which is gonna allow us to reflect and show exactly what's happening on the ground, uh, including our state partners, like the Department of Transportation. They pinpoint can tell us exactly where DUI and drug-related crashes happen. Well, we're gonna overlay our service data, will be there, and then overlay that kind of data. Are we making a difference? Are we actually tackling the problem that's on the ground? And without that, never would have saw it. And what that started for us was a commitment and I would say this to anybody in government or any private sector, you need to be invested in the application you go and purchase on a service contract. Be a partner and you know, that helps grow the process. And that's really, for me, I learned a lot from Kit Solutions when I started and it's allowed me to help grow what we're doing, but also my partners in other states to become leaders in, in collecting drug and alcohol prevention information. You know, uh, we do a lot of business not only in the United States, but also in Europe. We've got some, uh, quite a few clients in Germany. And I met with some state IT execs, uh, I forget which, which of the German states, they have smaller states than we have here in the United States. And they are going through a very similar process of trying to rationalize uh, a lot of these agency specific um, uh, uh, application services and trying to share them across the entire federal uh, uh, and state system. So it's, it's very interesting. In this case, you've got a custom app that now has uh, acted as the foundation for a not only statewide set of initiatives, but uh, how many? 18 states now, I guess. There's up to, I think it's close to 18 states. Um, you know, for us, it's a mandated uh, software that must be used by all our uh, county government that does drug and alcohol and then the provider system. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's a lot of data. Um, Managing the servers at, at, for RIT was, you know, again, very difficult. They don't just support our one entity. And Kit Solutions is focused on us and what we do. And that allows us to have the kind of software. I will say that procurement uh, process is always challenging in government, uh, especially state governments. Uh, when Kit approached the service model, uh, we deliver on deliverable-based type contracting. And of course, how do you put down the <laughs> deliverable of a service? So our contracts folks, our IT folks had a very hard time. And really my deliverable was I get a monthly report because they're, doing, they're running the software. Um, you know, and that, that I think is a challenge working within state governments. Um, even though the cloud's sort of there, I think it's just very difficult to get that tangible hands around what we do. Listen, I want to come back to the, all this contracting issue, and I, I think uh, privacy and security and data management, I think these are, in particular in your case, very, very interesting because you're dealing with some very sensitive data, right? But yes. I'd like to, to turn it to our other panelists, Mike, to share with us a little bit about what's going on in Arlington. 
Sure, Arlington County, as you know, is uh, directly across the river here. And uh, with being in economic development, much like your business, it's relationship-based. So back in 1997, 98, we had the vision to say we need a CRM system. And we went down several different paths to um, either procure or investigate different customer relationship management systems. Each time we went out as an agency and didn't involve our IT department uh, from the central office, uh, it, it, it hit snags. We went down a path, um, invested about $70,000 in development, and then learned it wasn't compatible with our email system. And then we went down another path, and uh, it was uh, client server based. And the price tag to even bring them into the door was approximately $125,000 to even get the system up and running. And so that was in 2005, so we made the decision to go to the cloud. And we said, Let, let's buy a subscription-based service. We went sole source, local government. We can, I think, um, be a little bit closer to those procurement executives to convince them that uh, we actually have a sole source reason for um, going with uh, who we decided on, which was Salesforce.com. You heard Dan Burton up here talking Salesforce.com. We were the first local economic development agency uh, in the US to go with Salesforce.com. And it's a little bit curious in the local government area to actually sell something. We're not in the goods provision uh, space. We, we, we sell office space at this point. So, all of the uh, vacant buildings in Arlington County, there aren't very many, uh, all of, we, we go through attraction and retention activities to make sure that they are filled and uh, adding to the tax base in Arlington. And so our products that we sell is actually jobs as well as uh, leased square footage. And uh, we have any number of uh, uh, opportunities active at any one time, and we do approximately um, three million square feet per year. That's with two business development executives. So each one of them is doing about one and a half million square feet of uh, activity within the um, commercial sector in Arlington. And the way that they do that is they use the adopted uh, process that is in Salesforce. So as uh, staff members come and go, what happens is they simply adopt the, the process that's already been established the relationships that we have had with commercial development brokers, it's already in the system. And so a real benefit that we hadn't realized uh, when we first launched Salesforce was that business processes are already defined. Any updates that come, come through Salesforce.com as enhancements. And so we don't even have to involve our central IT office. As you can probably um, anticipate, and maybe you've even had these uh, deliberations, when we were looking at the client server based model, that's exactly where our IT office was. And they, they wanted us to have the data in house, make sure that we had secure servers because this is very sensitive data. And as we had the discussion, the discussions went something like, uh, you need to protect the data. Well, can you fund it? We need to protect the data. Can you fund it? And it came down to our uh, moving to the cloud was about the thir a third of the cost for us to go from client server based to the subscription service that we now use with Salesforce. Now, as I recall, you said you had about 30, 35 users, is that yes, right? that's correct. And really, the application really is around three or four different domains. You've sure got the whole is. visitors thing and... Yeah, I mean, the other area that we are, we're in destination marketing. And so, what we do is try to attract meeting planners to come to Arlington. So, an event such as this, should have been in Arlington, but with it not being in Arlington, I still talk about it. Um, we attract meeting planners to uh, come into the county and bring that economic benefit to the county. So blocks of hotel rooms that are sold with events. Uh, various uh, venues, uh, for example, when you're here for a meeting and conference, what do you do in the after hours? What we have wanted to do is to sell Arlington as a great destination. DC is nice, but we have a very lively restaurant and nightlife scene, so after your conference, we want you to stay in the county and bring that economic benefit. We also, when you sign up for a visitor's guide online, that uh, information that you uh, submit to us goes directly into Salesforce, and then we turn that back around and do email marketing 
to bring up different promotions that we have, such as with the Washington Nationals, or with Arena Stage, or tickets and dining uh, with uh, Signature Theater, for example, in Sherlington. Well, listen, I'd love to kind of, let's, let's weave to another theme. Let's talk about the, the biggest benefits, but also some of the biggest challenges that sure. you faced. And, and we'll always start with you. One of the things that we talked about is this whole idea that you're really using the Salesforce engine as your, around, as, as your master database. And, yes, and the, we are. And, and so some of those challenges, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, everybody has data quality issues. So uh, we had a process when we first began, which was to dump all of your contacts into the database. If you need a great cat acupuncturist or a great orthopedist, we had a business development manager that had their personal contacts that also got into our database. So some lessons learned really was to make sure that you cleanse the data before you put it into uh, your database. So you probably have some others, Garrison. Well, for us, one of the, the things that I think um, was always a challenge is in human services, especially this prevention side, is we do great work. We shouldn't have to collect data. Well, that's true. However, in this environment, economic climate, you, you got to show what you do. And um, I have things where there's things we've added to the system and folks will take, oh, it takes us five hours, it takes us 20 hours, and we spend $50,000 for a person but only spend 25000 to actually do services. And I go, oh, yeah? Well, I don't like Big Brother, but I do like playing Big Brother. One of the biggest advantages I, I received with being in the cloud is everything is being tracked, every movement within the system. So my boss has actually used that that we can get beyond the you know, it takes forever kind of nonsense to, you know, there are always there are things in software that need to change, but we can focus on, on actually using the data that, that's there. So that's been a real big plus. On the challenge side, I think for us has been the garbage in, garbage out. Uh, as much as that's always a challenge, I do think having a, a, a cloud, you know, a service type software is that we can work with the vendor to get rules and things in there to actually cleanse that data faster. And what we do like the most is their ability to communicate. The system communicates through email constantly to us at the state, to our county government, to our provider systems. When things are done wrong, uh, including people don't want to put staff time, how long it takes to do something. Well, they leave the system, they don't finish it out. Well, when they get the law going, it goes right back to staff time. They can't go anywhere else. And they'll, they'll call up and say, well, I can't understand why I can't get off that. Well, you're not going to until you complete that. Those are logical <laughs> things built into the software that we had no capability in the past to do, but would spend hours and hours of my staff time, which they shouldn't be doing, to try to like work with the provider system and, and call IT and have a lot of back-ended data things done. And that, that's just very time consuming. So the big benefit, really, it's a, it's a process, a set of changes, but also significant shifting of the, you know, the use of your, your resources and, and the activities that they're involved with. Yeah. Okay, great. So, you know, I have found, you know, one of the great benefits of software as a service really is that it brings best in class business processes or, or, or business rules. Have you seen, seen that in your experience? Um, you know, for me, I, yes. I mean, I think that clearly um, it, it's improved. Obviously, you know, our vendor has done more in the last three years in this model, I think, than even knowing what they had done in the past. Now, I am in a unique situation because we are, um, it was originally built for Pennsylvania, so that's sole source, I have to go down that path all the time. Um, and we were talking yesterday about it's sole source, um, they own the code, we can't go anywhere else, and you think, well, go once get approval and you never have to do that again. Once again, I gotta go through the same exact process to get approval and I think that was the conversation we had, is <laughs> governors change. And even when the governor gets reelected, unfortunately, it seems that every four years, we like to change procurement. So is this every year, even though you have a contract, sole source, you can't go anywhere else, somehow you have to rebid this? Well, not rebid, basically go through the process of really getting and saying, I have to justify that Kit Solutions is the company. And the reason for it is we signed the contract way, way, way back that they own it. There's nowhere else to go. So um, it's, it's called government bureaucracy. We like to make this go through a process. So I happen to actually have a contract. I cannot add to it. I have to do a new contract. We had some infusion of federal dollars. 
And unfortunately, I'm going to have to go through and justify a sole source, take three weeks just to do that, and the outcome is going to be the same. Every year you have to do yeah, this. Every, well, it'll be every three years. It just happens to be this. It's a one-year contract, and I have one year remaining on my existing contract. You would think there would have been an easier process. But I do think because at state-level government, they're still trying to figure out what this cloud is. And as I said, we have an OAIT. We heard that, you know, general services and stuff uh, have that. But we also have a health department IT. And as much as you would think they work real cooperative, a lot of times it doesn't happen. So we go down one path and then procurement becomes something else. And we have been told the sole source of procurement is changing. So I'm going to get to learn a new methodology. <laughs> okay. How, how about yourself in, in Arlington? Do you have to rebid this every year? We, we do not have to rebid this every year. We've been fortunate to convince um, the procurement folks that uh, this uh, is a waste of time to rebid. And by wasting uh, valuable time for us, we're actually taking away from uh, other activities which are more valuable. So we've been very fortunate in having a flexible. And that's be primarily because you're local, you feel you have more control, et yes. cetera. Okay, terrific. So, you know, our, our audience here today is a mix of both, you know, government uh, uh, staff as well as suppliers, um, both uh, agencies or uh, consulting companies and, and uh, software and hardware providers. So, what guidance would you give to on the supplier side? of how best to navigate state and local governments to be successful in selling their services? Well, for uh, local government anyway, the, uh, the model uh, that has been built by our partner, um, who is Blonde Consulting, they actually built the platform on Salesforce, and they share it now um, on what is uh, the app exchange for Salesforce. And so we're constantly being contacted uh, for advice and uh, sort of consultation on how economic development agencies across the nation and, and actually in Canada, I've gotten an increasing number of calls from uh, our friends north of the border. And essentially, I, I would say that you know, understanding the business of the agency that you're working with is probably the best, um, the best advice I can give because what happens is agencies always believe that they're different, that their business processes are unique, and that they are special. And in a lot of cases, they are. However, I think that uh, that business process review has to be done in such a way that it uh, embraces the technology, accounts for the technology, and allows for some freedom of movement in terms of your objects, your fields, as well as um, being able to pass off the um, accountability pieces if you're uh, developing a workflow. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then I will open it up to our audience uh, if you have any questions before we would uh, wrap it up and go to lunch. So, you know, in, in terms of, of other low hanging fruit that may exist either in your agency or other agencies at the state or local level, what do you see uh, else going on in the cloud, uh, either in Arlington or in PA? or in things that you potentially could see major areas of initiative? For, for us, uh, we, um, six months ago, we actually uh, had our election office develop their um, instance within Salesforce. And so with the election coming up of 2012, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of scrutiny on the electoral board office to not only adhere to uh, federal election laws, but also state election laws as well as local election laws. They had been using an antiquated um, legacy system of uh, Microsoft Access, and it was a fine database, but there wasn't any accountability, and the reporting was not as robust as what uh, Salesforce can provide. So essentially what it comes down to is in the elections business, you have to show that you are communicating not only your expectations with those um, election chairs, but also the training aspects. And so this will train, uh, this will track the training of those that are at the local precincts and uh, be able to adhere to all of the applicable laws that uh, the electoral board has to um, adhere to. And I think, um, in, at least in the Commonwealth, uh, our Governor Corbett, he has pushed a private, um, you know, public partnership. So again, I think there's a great opportunity available. Uh, clearly, the idea is to reduce government uh, which can be IT folks and as well as other folks there. 
but efficiency is a key. So I think, you know, coming in and being able to show with what you have to offer is that it's not just the same thing, but you have a lot more to offer, which means your, your, your ability to put forth the latest technology, which often government doesn't and it can't do, I think is critical. And I do think that the right mix of things is that the environment's there. Again, we, we have huge cuts coming in our state budget, um, and I think that our IT folks are looking for innovative, innovative ways to uh, actually get more for less uh, and make it easier access for the general public as well. So I think there's good opportunities in our state with being the second year of our, our governor. So let me open it up to uh, the audience. Any uh, questions from, uh, for our panelists? Okay, I know we're uh, getting close to lunch here. It's always great to, uh, to be right before uh, you know, the, the food chow. So let me, uh, let me throw out one last question and I'll, I'll uh, you know, direct it not to our providers but more to uh, uh, your advice and, and guidance for our, our uh, federal and state and local uh, users. And that would be you know, go, going back to the, your desk uh, or, or their desk tomorrow what piece of advice would you give them? You know, you've had a lot of experience, not only procuring, but using and managing. You know, there may be issues related to change management. There could be uh, issues of managing data. Uh, there could be certain guidelines related to how you're going about procuring solutions. What would be the one big takeaway or one big piece of advice or advisory that you would give our federal and state uh, users who are migrating to the cloud based upon your experience? Well, for me, I think the biggest advice is do not rely on your other entities within your organization you probably have to work through. Um, you be the champion and be the lead. Uh, you know, when you're expected to have a statement of work uh, completed by the person that handles that, uh, stay on top of that and don't assume. I think that's the best advice I could give. And by being that champion, I think also makes it more difficult for the, the powers to be as you move up and, and through the procurement process to actually kill it. Because the person who needs it most is there ahead of the table saying, I need this done yesterday. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge sometimes, but have that focus. And I also would say the other best advice is look at making sure you have someone that can replace you, which means staff that work underneath you, have them part of that process so that if something happens, uh, they can be there. And I, I do that because last year I was sitting in the hospital this day uh, having fusion surgery on my neck. So for six weeks I, I was out and we were actually in the middle of redoing things with Kid Solutions. If my staff would have had no knowledge, we would have been way behind in, in, in our uh, process of moving forward. Yeah, I think succession planning and, and managing, I think, is a, is a very good piece of advice. Mike? Sure. Uh, I would say that the uh, technology should not drive behavior in your agencies, that you have to make sure that the change management piece is there no matter what technology you're going to adapt. And do, not to blame it on the technology that it was not robust enough or not uh, ready to be implemented within your agency. You really need to make sure that people are ready to change uh, before the technology will change them. Yeah, I think that's a very good piece of advice. Over here. Um, one, one issue that comes up, uh, I'm a user, so uh, not, not a drug user, by the way. Uh, uh, so um, one of the issues that comes up is how do you understand the, um, uh, how, how do you get your people to understand that when they're, involved in developing a business process that is going to be adaptable to a new technology. They have to actually go back and think through what is it they're trying to do. I mean, one of the biggest concerns that I have in, in our organization is that people, as you say, they don't like the change, so they just want the technology to do exactly what they did before. Just, just do what we did before. Instead of taking it as an opportunity to thinking through, how is there a better way to do this? How, what kind of improvements can I make? And will the technology help me get there? So I'd like your comments, please, around that, that issue. Sure, I think uh, for us, uh, it really required a lot of consensus building within the teams to have them come together. And not one of them could come with the entire picture of this is how I develop an opportunity to fill a million square feet per year. And so it really is consensus building and you need to have the conversations over time because so many of our business processes are cyclical and as things ebb and flow, you need to be able to understand that the fields that uh, need to be represented by the information um, can accommodate the actual natural flowing process 
of doing a business deal. And it, I think for us, um, it's something that I saw uh, as a challenge in 2005. The state of Virginia actually does use the software. His solutions is, is there. They have actually a staff person working in the state office. And um, they had a users group, kind of a novel concept. But that's for me how we're able to move forward is that I have uh, our county government folks and then our, our provider system at the table. And they get to be able to help decide. They don't set policy, but they help decide how the flow of that functionality works. And, it, and sometimes it doesn't, but they're there to provide solutions. We meet four times a year, but throughout we use the, you know, the technology. In fact, they had a meeting yesterday that I wasn't at, and um, I just read a long laundry list of things that you know, they want to see. But that becomes my voice then to the public side and the other users is that's your representatives. You know, you, your stakeholders are at the table. And I think that's why I've seen the advancement, because I'll be honest, they also helped us get that cloud contract because they actually wrote letters into my boss saying why it was so important to have Kit Solutions in this service model, which would really help us move our field forward. You know, maybe I can add a few comments here as well. I think this applies both to the public sector and to private sector. You know, so often we are, when we build new systems, we're just replicating yesteryear's process flows, right? And the way it was done. And one of the great benefits of third-party software as a service solutions in particular is that it brings new industry best practices and a new way of thinking about a business problem. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, Workday, for example, who I just use them as an example in HR, these guys have completely rethought the, the whole HR paradigm. And rather than thinking of it as a series of isolated um, islands of automation, have rethought in a new set of workflows that cut across many of these, right? Or even if you take it in a, a technology uh, solution, ServiceNow, I don't know if anybody has ever used ServiceNow, which is rather than looking in the area of IT management and systems management as a series of isolated business processes, right? A help desk or change management or whatever, they rethought about it and cut across all of these in an integrated way. Um, so I, I think it's a very dangerous thing to just replicate business processes that were encoded 20, 30, 40 years ago when we first automated many of these systems. A, a, a great uh, observation that one of my clients is the chief technology officer of Thomson Reuters, very bright guy, James Powell. And he said one of the biggest benefits of software as a service to him Right now, this is public sector, information media, et cetera. But I think it's very equally applicable to the government. Is that it has, it has given him an argument to his business users around the high cost of customization. OK? So he, this is an organization pushed together through acquisition. And they have so, this thing is a mess, <laughs> right? Uh, just be due to those acquisition of all these different companies. And by going down the route of using industry best practices and business processes and workflow, modernized workflow, he, the, the, the biggest thing is that in the long run, it's going to be massively less expensive because of this whole issue of customization, that you will not have to, all the version management stuff and staying current with all the gobbledygook, all that's pushed to the suppliers. So I don't know if those observations help at all, but I, thought, I think that's a, a very meaningful one. So. We have another question over here. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Maria Sinopri. I'm an independent contractor. Um, uh, my question is a kind of a two-faced question. Uh, the first question would be, would you say that it was easier to go into cloud because you were smaller and therefore more agile? Because in, when I'm speaking to you guys, it seems your staffs, you really had really small staffs. And then my second question um, would be, if, um, if that helped, what were your obstacles in terms of, of being able to uh, enter in, into cloud networking? What, what did you have to um, present in order to kind of win the argument to go in that, in that direction? Mm -hmm. Well, for, for me, um, you know, my challenge was a little bit different. Again, it was, it was procuring where our IT department had brought that in-house and was running it. And, you know, you don't ever like to throw anybody under the bus, but eventually it's what it did come for us, is that um, they are not, we're not able to deliver what we needed. 
and I think the realization is that just for instance, right now, 15 minutes I'm down, there is a backup system to go to. I didn't have that, and here's the thing. As I said, it's drug and alcohol prevention. It's not life or death, and frankly, they couldn't care less if it went down. I mean, that's just reality, and I, I accept that. But that's not necessarily fair to those that I have to serve as far as making sure they have a tool in hand. So by having this cloud process, I could tell you my staff wanted it for two years because they weren't hired to be help desk. And that's literally what they play. So we never, as I said, we were data rich, information poor. We were never looking at actually our data because we answered the phone all the time on how to use the system. So I think that argument from the field being partners, as I mentioned, and my own staff, and you know my history of being from 2002 on, I, we put it together because we have different deputy secretaries that were doing with this, that I was persistent, and that's, that's why it went forward. I don't think it's that way for everybody, but that was the internal battle we had to take place within our health department. Maria, for us, it was really, uh, we had a business case to make. I'm not sure it mattered what size we were. Uh, it, probably mattered more of what size our technology office was centrally. And so what it was, was came down to the issue of resources and who was going to actually bear the cost of those resources, not only in the investment side, but also on the ongoing maintenance side. But I, I, I'm not sure that size matters in this case because I think that if you have clarity of business purpose, you can make that argument. Um, and again, it's, it's relationship-based. Uh, there's no way that we would have gotten as far as we did if we didn't play well with others. And so we certainly opened up the security uh, uh, standards uh, to our central technology uh, office to make sure that they could sign off and agree that the data was going to be secure um, as we implemented the system. Yeah, I, I would concur. I don't think it has anything to do with small versus large. Yeah. We've been tracking this market for before it was called cloud, before it was called SaaS, we called it pay go back in 2003. And the earliest adopters of these types of technologies were larger enterprises, in fact. And I would say today that uh, whether it's public or private, probably 30 to 40 percent of small businesses don't even know what it is. They get marketed solutions, they get marketed services, but they're not focused on this cloud thing, right? So um, the earliest adopters were larger enterprises, but the issue is what had they been adopting? And our research clearly suggests that the focus early on was and continues to be around point business processes. And I think both of these are perfect examples, right? Now the issue is how quickly will we be moving to core business processes, right? And in mid-range, small to mid-range, we have seen a quicker migration, look at companies like NetSuite and, and others that are or intact that are providing core financials or, or HR or whatever. And only now are we starting to see larger enterprises focused around key, key business processes. Uh, and I think that's the big shift. I think there's been a sea change, in particular in large enterprise CIOs in the government and public sector, over the last 18 to 24 months whereas it had been a learning kind of environment in early 2010. Today, most um, large enterprise CIOs view the cloud, they're not afraid of it, and they view it as another weapon to be deployed uh, along with a lot of other assets uh, and weapons that they can deploy for a particular business problem. So, uh, listen, I know we're running up to the lunch. I apologize. Uh, I never like to keep get between people and their food but we'll be around during the lunch hour. So let me thank our, both of our panelists uh, for their time today. Yeah.